Marvel's Captain Marvel is due to open in wide release on March 8th of 2019. As per February 14th, three weeks prior to opening, tracking figures suggest the movie will open to 100 million in its opening weekend. Taken in isolation, that is a huge number, one which implies that Captain Marvel does have the potential to exceed Wonder Woman's 103 million opening weekend. So the good folks at Marvel and Disney may want to at least get the champagne ready for the premiere. They shouldn't pop it just yet though, because not two weeks ago, the movie was tracking to open in the 140 to 180 million dollar range, which were the peak estimates in an up to then upwards trend. Because earlier, the movie was first tracking to open in the 120 million range, then the 140 million range, and as we got closer to release, the 160 to upwards of 180 million dollar range, before now suddenly plummeting down to the 100 million range. So what happened? Who is to blame for this? Or is there more to it? In this video, I will first provide some context into these numbers, and why we shouldn't jump to conclusions based on them just yet. Then I'll explore the personal politics that star Brie Larson is prone to expressing in public, and what Disney and Marvel might think about that, before rounding out with how well those very politics worked out for Kathleen Kennedy and for Star Wars. This is a subject matter where one can easily get carried away, so let's try not to do that. First of all, while some may be tempted to think that Captain Marvel's opening weekend just got downgraded from 160 million to 100 million, that is jumping to conclusions. First of all, tracking is just an estimate based on a variety of different metrics, and different tracking companies may use different metrics and thereby arrive at different figures. Case in point, all of those earlier figures, which had Captain Marvel's opening weekend estimate grow from 120 million to 160 million, and even upwards of 180 million, came from largely the same place, boxofficepro.com. By contrast, this most recent tracking figure is not from there. Instead, it comes from a variety of industry sources, and the figure is a ballpark one. One tracking insider told Deadline Hollywood that the tracking is 100 million, give or take 20 million. Which means that, according to industry tracking, the movie could open north of 120 million, which would put it in line with the lower end of the earlier box office pro estimates. But then again, that also means an opening in the 80 million dollar range is equally possible. But here is the thing though, since that earlier 160 million tracking figure came from a different place than the current 100 million tracking figure, we cannot know for certain that audience interest in the movie has gone down. Hear me out. It is not outside the realm of possibility that Box Office Pro's method of calculating the numbers contains a systematic error, which led to their tracking estimates being inflated, meaning that 160 million figure might never have reflected reality. Their past track record is a bit spotty, let's say. Only if Box Office Pro uses the exact same metrics as before, without altering them for the purpose of getting in line with the current industry tracking and they still arrive at the same figures as it, can we ascertain that there actually has been a testable and verifiable decline in interest? Because then we'd be comparing apples to apples. That being said, while we cannot say for certain that there has been a decline in interest over the course of the last couple of weeks, we also cannot rule it out. The difference between the 160 to 180 million estimates just two weeks ago and the 100 million estimate we're seeing now is such a staggering one that it is hard to believe that it could be down to differences in metrics and measuring methods alone. Especially when you consider that in between those two different tracking figures, some rather divisive comments made by Brie Larson have been making the rounds. Brie Larson is an outspoken adherent of identity politics and representation. In June of 2018, while accepting the final statuette at the Crystal and Lucy Awards, Brie Larson did not address the Me Too or the Time's Up movement, nor did she thank her family or friends or agency. Instead, she addressed the bubbling issue of the lack of representation among film critics. Am I saying that I hate white dudes? No, I'm not. I do not need a 40-year-old white dude to tell me what didn't work for him about A Wrinkle in Time. It wasn't made for him. I want to know what that film meant 
to women of color, to biracial women, to teen women of color, to teens that are biracial. In an interview with In Style magazine, published February 5th, Captain Marvel is described as the ultimate feminist hero, and Larson told the publication that the movie was the biggest and best opportunity I could have ever asked for, and it was like my superpower. This could be my form of activism, doing a film that can play all over the world and be in more places than I can be physically. For a February 7th interview with Marie Claire, Larson handpicked Kaya Brown to conduct the interview, on the grounds that she is black, female, and disabled. Commenting specifically on this, Larson said, About a year ago, I started paying attention to what my press days looked like and the critics reviewing movies, and I noticed it appeared to be overwhelmingly white male. So I spoke to Dr. Stacy Smith at the USC Annenberg Inclusion Initiative, who put together a study to confirm that. Moving forward, I decided to make sure my press days were more inclusive. In the article, Kia Brown writes, and this is important. Meeting Larson in person for the first time, it is immediately clear why she was chosen for this role. Passionate, funny, genuine, and kind, she's eager to see the diverse and inclusive world she lives in reflected back on the big screen. She might not be a superhero in real life, but she's ready to fight like one to make the world better. As was intended, this story spread like wildfire and was picked up far outside of Marie Claire's space of readership. In the retelling, though, the focus was shifted to the implied part of her statement. I don't think anyone wants to begrudge black, female, or disabled workers of opportunities. But the growing perception that Brie Larson hates white men, whether she does or not, she has claimed that she doesn't, is an unfortunate one. And for the third time, I don't hate white dudes. But where the movie-going audience is concerned, white males still make out a pretty good chunk of it. However distorted it may be, the perception that Captain Marvel herself does not want white males to see her movie is increasingly making the rounds. Let me stress that Brie Larson has never said anything remotely to that effect, not in so many words, but that is nonetheless a perception that appears to be spreading. Such a perception could prove detrimental to the movie's ultimate box office. If the movie is a crowd pleaser though, it will still do good, even if it should come in at the lower end of estimates, an $80 million opening weekend would be nothing to scoff at, although Marvel and Disney are no doubt counting on and hoping for much more. This was not a cheap movie to make, and Brie Larson herself was paid more than any male MCU star has ever been paid in their first movie outing. Money is very much so a factor here. Captain Marvel does have an overall feminist land, and that is by Marvel and Disney's explicit design. They did know what they were getting into when they hired Brie Larson, and as was indicated in the Marie Claire interview, her views and outspokenness could very well have contributed to her getting the role in the first place. What is more, you can take it to the bank that these articles, as well as others to come, have been proofread and given the go-ahead by Disney's marketing department. They will probably even have paid for multiple of these articles and interviews themselves, CBS All Access style. This brings us to the crux of the matter. All the comments covered thus far are more likely to be deliberate parts of the movie's marketing campaign than they are the results of Brie Larson speaking out of turn. Remember last year, when Black Panther was a huge hit? It was actually more than a huge hit. It was a phenomenon, a cultural event, and according to the media, a defining moment for black people. Inner city schools, churches and organizations even arranged trips to see Black Panther in theaters, and charities arranged for tickets for many who otherwise might not have afforded it, to be able to pay to go see it. All of this helped push Black Panther to an unbelievable $700 million at the domestic box office alone, which I'm sure Marvel and Disney didn't mind one bit, as they were the ones swimming in all of that sweet, sweet MCU cash. With Captain Marvel, a movie which opens on March 8th, otherwise known as the International Women's Day, it would appear that they're going for a similar strategy, only this time, the women's movement is the movement of choice. There has even popped up some campaigns to fund tickets for girls that otherwise could not afford to go. Despite what some have reported though, several of these campaigns do allow boys to go as well. 
Remember when Brie Larson said that she had no interest in what white reviewers thought of A Wrinkle in Time because it wasn't made for them? Well, on a similar note, if you like genre entertainment, her recent interviews with In Style Magazine and Marie Claire were not made for you. The trailers are for you. These articles were made for the female readership of those magazines, an audience which is unlikely to be fans of comic book movies, but which is likely to agree and identify with what Brie Larson is saying here, especially if she throws in ideological buzzwords like patriarchy. Having either read those articles directly, or having heard about them, or their overall message associated with Captain Marvel, this audience might actually notice next time they come across Captain Marvel posters or TV spots, something they otherwise might have been blind to. The thing to keep in mind here is that while many of Marvel's built-in fans have taken issue with the things Larson has said, her statements have so far been quite tame compared to what some others sharing her ideology and worldview have been known to express, but still sufficient to bring, and I hate to use the term, the woke audience on board because you can rest assured that Larson will have been told by Disney in no uncertain terms that while it is part of her job to promote the feminist angle of the movie, there is a line and she had better not cross it. Because here, Disney and Marvel have made the calculated gamble that the built-in audience will show up anyway, getting prepared for Avengers Endgame, so they can spend some of the marketing budget towards influencing a segment of the audience that otherwise would not go into going, all while scoring brownie points in the process. But there is a definite risk associated with this. Look no further than the other notable Disney brands. When Kathleen Kennedy took over Lucasfilm, she brought her ideology with her. An ideology which on paper can be sold as inclusive, but for many practical purposes is exclusionary, and assigns value to the individual not based on character or merit, but on ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, and religion. On Star Wars, this has manifested itself both behind the cameras and on screen. Kennedy has explicitly stated that one of her goals was to get more girls into Star Wars. There is very little evidence to suggest that they have actually succeeded in bringing in a new female fanbase of any note, but there is a growing mountain of evidence which does suggest that in the process they alienated and lost a sizable chunk of their already built-in audience, who just so happened to be majority male and white male at that, the very audience segment that the ideology Kathleen Kennedy subscribes to openly and explicitly vilifies. Fans walking away is noticeable and measurable, only Disney themselves know the true cost so far, but outside analysts can make estimates. For instance, Andrew Clary, economist, consultant, published author, YouTuber and blogger, estimates that infusing politics and ideology into Star Wars has conservatively wiped out 75% of the value of what was once the world's most profitable movie franchise. Again, I stress that number is an estimate, coming from one source, but what is indisputable is that The Last Jedi opened huge only to drop hard in subsequent weeks. Solo outright flopped, the merchandise is collecting dust on shelves, and a sizable chunk of former lifelong fans are actively campaigning against Episode 9. Kathleen Kennedy's intentions for Star Wars backfired badly, and a reckoning is forthcoming. The firing of story group leader Kiri Hart is an example of that. What is more, the constant vilification of white males have made them more receptive to anything that reminds them of what was done to Star Wars under Kathleen Kennedy's watch. To a great many people, that was personal. And now they're going to do that to Marvel as well? That is the worry of many fans out there. It is against that backdrop that Brie Larson's comments have been so poorly received among many Marvel fans. But Marvel Studios is run by Kevin Feige, and they have avoided any major pitfalls so far. However, with Captain Marvel, they are treading on the same ground that turned into a sinkhole right under Star Wars. Will Captain Marvel find a better balance? Will it be a, to borrow a quote, defining moment for women, like Black Panther was said to have been for black people, without alienating a huge swath of the fanbase in the process? Or will it pull a Star Wars and snap away half the audience, Thanos style? Let me know what you think in the comments. If you like this video, then please help share it and share your opinion in the comments. Midnight's Edge aims to give the most comprehensive analysis and commentary on genre culture and entertainment. If you would like to see more of our videos, then please subscribe, hit the bell icon, 
and remember to indicate that you would like to be notified when new videos are uploaded. If you really like what we do, then please support us on Patreon until a better alternative comes along, or send us a direct donation through PayPal. Also check out our sister channel Midnight's Edge After Dark for live shows and other rants. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and stay tuned for more here at Midnight's Edge.